and welcome uh, to this third and last uh, lecture of the Digital Delights and Disturbance series, uh, Spring 22 edition. Uh, so we started this journey this semester uh, of the series by hosting a, lect hosting a lecture on the aesthetics of memes. And last week we continued the journey with the panel on uh, about NFTs and uh, blockchain culture, uh, which will be soon uh, available on the JCU uh, TV channel for those who miss, missed it. Uh, today, uh, we're going to cover the issue of uh, algorithmic power and resistance uh, with a lecture on uh, algorithmic solidarity. Uh, as you know, the computational logic uh, of algorithms and databases uh, allows digital platforms to uh, exercise new, uh, new forms of power, which are increasingly resisted uh, on the same uh, terrain of digital media. Um, and this evening, I'm very happy to welcome uh, uh, Tiziano Bonini and uh, Emiliano Trere, who are going to uh, introduce and, uh, and, uh, and let us know a little bit better about the research topic. Uh, I had a great pleasure to approach part of their work uh, uh, via an article that came out uh, a few months ago uh, in the Media International Australia Journal. Uh, but it will also soon be published in a book edited by MIT Press. Okay, so don't miss that, don't miss that publication. It will be soon available. Uh, I'm also very happy to have them since I uh, share uh, much of their approach, especially in challenging uh, uh, the reductionism that for a long time uh, I've seen media uh, as mere transmitters to represent or organize social uh, and political struggles, um, and also because uh, of their attempt to shed light uh, on forms of resistance that are not uh, uh, only Western-based, uh, uh, given obviously that um, platforms are ruling uh, the lives of many all over the world. Okay, going to our speakers, uh, uh, Rizzano Bonini is uh, Associate Professor in Sociology of Media and Culture at the Department of Social, Political and Cognitive Science, uh, Sciences at the University of Siena, Tuscany in Italy. And his research focuses on the political economy of the media, uh, platform studies, media production, especially radio and also digital cultures. He is Vice Chair of the Radio and Sound Research Section of the European Communication Research Education Association, as well as being one of the uh, funding members of, uh, of the Cultural Association of Fare. He published many books, uh, such as Radio Audiences and Participation in the Age of, of Network Society, uh, which has been edited by Rutledge, and also in Italian, uh, uh, books such as uh, Così Lontano, Così Vicino, and Hipster. So thank you very much, Tiziano, for being uh, with us. Uh, Wes Emiliano Trare is a reader in uh, data agency and media ecologies uh, in the School of Journalism, Media and Culture at Cardiff University in Wales, UK. His research, research focuses on digital activism, social movement, critical data studies, uh, with a focus on Latin America and the Global South. Uh, he is one of the co-directors of the Data Justice Lab and co-founder of the Big Data from the South Initiative. Uh, he wrote and co-edited many books, uh, amongst these hybrid media activism, uh, which has been published by Rutledge uh, in 2019, uh, that won also the Outstanding Book Award uh, uh, of the International Communication Association, Interest, Interest Group Activism, Communication and Social Justice. But I would like also to mention two uh, co-edited publications uh, uh, by Emiliano, uh, COVID-19 from the margins, uh, uh, which was published by the Institute of Network Culture and the Citizen Media and Practice, uh, uh, also published by Rutledge. Uh, thank you very much also to you, Emiliano, for being with us. And for our audience, uh, as always, uh, we are going to start with the lecture. It's going to last for 30, 40 minutes. Uh, uh, and then we are going to open uh, the floor to comments uh, and also questions. Uh, so please uh, uh, join us for the discussion also later after the, uh, the, the lecture. 
So enjoy the talk uh, and, uh, and again, many thanks to uh, our hosts. Well, many thanks to you for the invitation. Thanks a lot. It's a, it's a pleasure to be to be here, to be to be there and here <laughs> in a in a kind of made with uh, a sense of place way. Um, and uh, you know, it's uh, it's great. Also, I'm my understanding that we're closing down these series of lecture of uh, with this beautiful title that you have devised and so. It's also an honor for us, for me and Tiziano. So, well, let's start, actually, so let me start this presentation before we transition to Tiziano, saying that um, we, we met with Tiziano uh, a few years ago, and uh, we didn't really, I mean, we, we had follow our work uh, in, in, in different ways, um, we we admire our respective work, but we haven't kind of find a, found a way to to collaborate. Uh, sometimes we know there are people around most of the times that we like uh, whose work we like, but we don't get a chance to to really get down to it. But then he invited me to see, and I mean sometimes these things uh, this is how things happen. And uh, you know I gave the lecture, but then we sort of talked we, we we began to talk a lot and to exchange opinions so uh, tiziano comes more from the cultural side as you mentioned in his introduction to his work you know the has been involved with a lot of uh, radio studies and studies of audiences creative kind of audiences whereas i'm more focused on politics and the way activism digital activism the agency of uh, of activists and protesters. But there's the one thing that we recognize both was this kind of shift uh, through algorithmic power that was going on, that was happening, and it's still happening increasingly in different fields, you know. Um, and, uh, and so we thought that we could maybe join our forces and uh, cast this light on this transformation with the project together. So this is when we decided to, to launch the Algorest, uh, Algorithmic Resistant Project. And Algorithmic Resistant is a, uh, is a term that I coined, uh, I guess, like something like, was it 2018, 16? Oof, I don't know. <laughs> the pandemic has made everything so messy. But let's say, you know, a few years ago, uh, in my observation of uh, uh, when I was an associate professor in Mexico, of how bots and kind of non-human actors were reshaping the uh, political scenario of uh, communication in Mexico, especially kind of dirty practices by the government and by kind of parties, uh, but at the same time, I focused on the resistance that was developed by activists to kind of counteract these attempts to silence them, to marginalize their voices. Uh, and this is where the, the, the concept of algorithmic resistance kind of was born. But then it emerges also in, in, in the context of Europe when we saw the 2011 kind of rise of anti-austerity movements such as the indignados that were some of the pioneers of this kind of resistance. So I witnessed this kind of resistance kind of emerging in, in politics and kind of both conventional and unconventional politics with social movements. But at the same time, Tiziano was witnessing this, the same kind of patterns, the same kind of processes in the realm of culture, in the realm of, for example, moderation being um, Spotify or other kind of practices and in the realm of gig working as that is something that we're going to guide you, we're going to expose, we're going to uh, talk about today. So it's, re it's really pervasive, you know, and with this project, we wanted to kind of shift the attention to, to these practices, to the tactics that people develop to deal with and to live with these algorithmic forms of power institution and authority. <clears throat> and this originates a bit from a frustration as, and, and you will bear, you were mentioning it as well, the frustration that some of us, uh, some researchers 
uh, has with the fact that usually algorithmic governance kind of frameworks are really you know bleak but also neglect agency in many ways or they either don't talk about it or they really undermine what people can do with algorithms and i think that we wanted to kind of switch to change the focus and illuminate the many ways uh, uh, with, with with which people can make sense repurpose algorithmic power so this is where we we said this is where we place and we locate this project that we are talking about today and there are like two ways we think that are you know in order to map this kind of terrain which i think it will be it's really useful for for students but also scholars alike uh, what we call you know a way to resist resisting to two algorithms and a way to resist through algorithms. So the first one is the way of looking at algorithms as stakes. And, and in this, we are in depth to uh, the vision of data stakes and data repertoire that uh, Stefania Milan and David Beraldo developed in their understanding of data activism. But we think that this could be further applied to, to the realm of algorithmic power. Let me clarify briefly what I mean. With the first one, you can resist to algorithm as stakes. And we have seen that in many, many different organizations or activists fighting against the biases, against the discrimination, against the issues that are associated to algorithmic systems across the world. And this is something that we take really, it's to the heart of what we do at the Data Justice Lab, trying to, uh, uh, kind of nourish data justice you know how can we make this more you know fairer but at the same time maybe we we, we need to take a step a step back and kind of uh, sometimes not develop these uh, kind of system altogether because they you know they're structurally biased and uh, unjust and this is the, the way we can resist to them but we can also decide you know have this lens of resisting through them and this is where we think it's really important. These, these dimensions are connected, by the way. You know, we we don't we don't conceive them as some kind of separate dimensions. They are connected, but the resistant uh, as repertoire is a classic. And if you are familiar with social movement studies, you will know, you know, with the concept of repertoire of contention that algorithms are now part an integrating part of the repertoire of contention, for example of contemporary movements. Algorithmic power pervades uh, these, uh, you know, all these platforms and you can rely and activists rely on them in ways that foster their social justice objectives and their needs. So this is a way to work and operate through algorithms on these platforms. These kind of levels, as I said, are connected. And in the book, uh, we usually, you look at them and how they influence each other, you know, at, at different levels. But I think it's uh, it's something that it, we might we might want to, to to focus on as we make sense of these of this battlefield. As in, as for the methodology, it's it's a lot to take in. It's been developed massively through the pandemic. Uh, lockdowns and mass and we can have a different talk regarding the, the difficulties that we needed to face the obstacles the quandaries it's uh, and in fact we have a chapter on methods that that, that that rather takes stock of that and maybe tithiana and i will we write something on methods and uh, we all know how, how difficult it was but we also know how what we call the methodological in a, a kind of imagination has been somehow revamped somehow uh, uh, boosted by 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 this so maybe maybe uh, and i'm saying maybe with you know a big m <laughs> something that uh, of a positive of of this messy kind of tragic period anyway and i'm, I'm saying this with a big m of course so we rely on a multi-method design so interviews with food delivery riders across different countries the italy mexico China, the India and Spain. Uh, so we got 
you know, quite the coverage of, of, of Italy, Latin America, and then some other kind of Asian countries, a big, big, really, you know, powerful countries and economies uh, like China and India, but also a massive player in Latin America, which is Mexico, of course. Uh, a lot of interviews uh, uh, in, in, the, in these different kind of countries uh, to online de delivery riders. Then we have different cities because it's important to have a balance. We got Querétaro, my oldest city where I used to live, and Mexico City, the big city of Mexico. We got Data, Guavalor, Mumbai, Pune, Lucknow, Chhattisgarh, Gurugram, Patna, Beijing, Shanghai, Shenyang, Weifang, and you name it. We got different kind of cities in Italy as well. We got Livorno, Florence, Milan. We got Naples, Messina. To have this kind of north south balance as much as we could and we got the same in spain with valencia barcelona and bilbao and and of course you know uh, to to have every country is a universe in itself but we try to maintain this balance in terms of platforms involved so we got different platforms of course some are the same some changes uber cabify dd in driver easy taxi you name it we got this multi-platform kind of approach uh, and of course, some countries got their own uh, unique kind of platform ecosystem uh, that you can see here. We can, you know, we can follow, we can, in the Q&A, we can answer more questions as to these platform ecosystems. Uh, and uh, um, uh, these are, you know, some of the platforms and some of the things that we looked at. Beside, we have one year participant observation inside private online groups. And this is another universe in itself because we, we used WhatsApp both for research between, you know, research field notes between the members of the team and, of course, the coordinators, me and Tiziano and the other uh, uh, assistants and research assistants involved. But also, too, we used WhatsApp as fieldwork, like looking at WhatsApp as part of their digital ethnography. So WhatsApp, WeChat, Facebook group and thousands of riders in all the five countries involved. And of course, there was also physical participant observation, especially in India and Italy uh, when possible. And of course, this was really, really dependent on the possibilities and the problem that the pandemic allowed or not in different period of the research. So you see that massive data and massive. And finally, before leaving uh, uh, you know, uh, the ball to Tiziano, uh, it's worth mentioning the really kind of uh, heuristic device of screenshots. So screenshots were really kind of uh, these uh, tool that we used of online chat conversation uh, among writers as kind of ethnographic data. And they, they were also kind of, uh, um, they were taken by the same writers and shared with us in order to get this inside perspective into what were they were doing to the practices. So they were really kind of one of the most, uh, I will say, helpful and nuanced way to get insights into, into that when we were doing the, the, the ethnography. And these were turned to be really useful in all the different countries that, that we explored. And, and as you can see here, you know, just kind of example, multilingual examples that we got here with different screenshots and uh, and this is a conversational method that you know we it's uh, we think it's really important and so um you know as uh, next uh, uh, regarding the insights and the findings and this concept of solidarity i will leave the ball rolling to tiziano that's going to guide you in into this into detail uh, about this thank you very much thanks uh, emiliano for um, this introduction and uh, this focus on uh, uh, methodology because was one of our main uh, um, challenges in, uh, in uh, trying to ground our findings and uh, theories on uh, a, a strong um, a strong uh, em uh, empirical uh, ground. So we wanted to uh, we we adopt, adopted a, a grounded uh, approach, grounded theory approach. So we really uh, uh, worked a lot 
you know, on a, in, a, in a cyclical and a, an a iterative process of uh, figuring out the first research questions, then uh, coming back to transcripts of the interviews, a lot of conversations with, between me and Emiliano to discuss these, uh, uh, these interviews. And finally, slowly taking shape, no, the, slow, the, the theory was slowly taking shape from, the, from bottom up. Um, and from these uh, uh, long discussions and, and long uh, um, process of uh, analyzing and reanalyzing and re reworking the, the, the fieldwork uh, notes and the, and the ethnographic materials, we found that um, our ref re reflection was focused on three main clusters of, uh, of findings. The first was uh, about the, the powerful, uh, the computational power and the rhetorical power that is around uh, uh, these uh, food, uh, food, uh, online food platforms, online food delivery platforms. And uh, the, um, we found uh, proofs, very uh, clear proofs of uh, the dynamics of gamification and how platforms are uh, designing the, their apps and their technology in order to push the workers against each other. So there is a, you know, a, an embedded competitive logics that nurture the, uh, the, the workings of this platform. The second cluster is uh, the way riders work, gig workers, found that the way they find new, new, um, new ways of escaping or partially resisting these uh, platform power, this computational power. So this, is, this was really exciting during our uh, fieldwork because we just hypothesized the, the existence of different kinds of tactics of resistance. But then when you, know, you put, the hands-on uh, in the ethnographic material and you talk with the riders and the, in different countries, you, you observe uh, all the conversations among them and you find that these tactics that we will uh, describe uh, in a while are widespread and uh, they, are, they um, adopt themselves to the different platforms in different countries, but they are everywhere. You know? There are riders doing very similar things in India, in China, in Italy, in Mexico, even without talking each other. So this is something that is really grounded in, uh, in the everyday life of, uh, of riders. And it's not uh, a tactic developed by a, a marginal group of uh, conscious riders or activists. Uh, of, uh, that. This, is some, this is something that very close to the idea of uh, everyday resistance. Uh, developed by uh, James Scott, no? because it's not something that comes from uh, an ideologically conscious and uh, uh, politically aware uh, workers. It's something that emerges from the very practice of everyday work. So they, they, um, they understand that it's quite simple. Every one of us, when he's uh, highly um, vinculated is highly structured by uh, a power, uh, uh, but a form of power, an institution uh, above us, we always find, we are humans that we are trying to find a way to escape this, uh, this pressure. You know? and, and we found a lot of ways of escaping the, the power exerted by, by algorithms and platforms on riders. And we found that uh, we, mm, there are individual and collective gaming tactics, so very different from, from each other. And the third cluster is the a kind of a, uh, fragile but emerging solidarity networks that was afforded, not, of course not determined, but was uh, uh, enabled by uh, online private chat, chat groups like WhatsApp or WeChat. So for example, uh, we, um, we found that food delivery platforms exert power on riders 
through gamification processes in two, with, in two different ways. The first is uh, the ranking system. So every platform has a, a ranking system. Now you can, you can see, for example, the, uh, some screenshots from Chinese writers that shared in the private groups uh, the results of uh, the screenshots of the app in which they are ranked in, uh, um, uh, on the platform. So Chinese food delivery platforms, every one of them in different ways, replicated forms of rankings similar to the, to the one working in the very popular mobile game Honor of Kings that is extremely popular in China. On May 1, for example, riders are divided into four different categories according to their weekly performance. So riders, riders ranks will drop if they perform poorly in a, um, in a week. So, and they are divided into bronze, silver, gold, and kings that are kind of superior league of riders. Uh, and in every league, every bronze, silver, gold, and kings level is, subdivided in another five kind of uh, sub levels. So it's very structured, this ranking. And uh, above these general ranking systems, there are also daily rankings list. For example, on May 1, riders are ranked according to number of, the number of orders they complete each day, the punctuality rate, the average time it takes to complete each other, to, to complete uh, each order and the total distance of food delivery they, uh, they make each day. So the top three riders in each category, in, in each of these uh, um, categories, like uh, number of orders, punctuality rate, et cetera, will receive at the end of the day, additional bonuses. So there is a, uh, a strong push to perform the best you can in order to get, be to get benefits. So there is a, no, this, through this mechanism of gamification, competition and uh, competitive behavior is, uh, uh, is embedded, is uh, um, uh, nudged, is, uh, is pushed inside, uh, is, um, inside the, uh, among the workers. Another example, this, is, this comes from Italy. Uh, this is how uh, Glovo, Deliveroo, and Uber Eats measure the reliability and the performance of every rider. On Deliveroo, for example, the second example uh, in Italy, until November 2020, every rider was divided into three leagues. The riders ranking in the first league were able to book working shifts before the riders belonging to the lower leagues. So what happened? So they always had more choices available than the other ones. So a newcomer that had to scale up until the superior league, well, uh, uh, if there were a lot of riders in a, in a specific city that every morning uh, opened the app and in order to book their shifts. So for a newcomer would be very, very difficult to scale, to reach the, the league A, no? Um, so here it's quite easy to see a kind of kind of a Sam Matthew, what the sociologists ca call the Sam Matthew effect in action, that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And then we we, we will just try to give you an, a very brief idea of uh, the, um, our findings, our uh, our discoveries, uh, and um, uh, our uh, analysis. No. Um, and um, another uh, cluster is the, the gaming tactics, the uh, individual and collective gaming tactics. Um, we um, not not really discovered, but maybe it's properly said we uh, from the from the analysis of, of this of the of the data we gathered, we uh, the interpretation of this data led us to see to categorize four main resistant tactics adopted by Chinese readers, uh, riders in this case, but these kind of tactics are, are uh, uh, common also in, uh, in other countries. For example, we will focus uh, specifically on the second and the third uh, kind of tactics, uh, but most of them in every country used to work for, multi for multiple platforms. 
In some countries, on some platforms, this is a, a banned behavior. It's not allowed, but they do. Uh, that, but the workers do uh, uh, do make uh, do work for different platforms because they try to make ends meet. You know, they uh, most of the time they are not able to uh, to earn a, a proper a proper wage just working for one platform. So they have a lot of smartphones. They use they are they used to uh, to ride with two, three, four different uh, smartphones connected to different uh, platforms. Or, for example, Chinese riders refuse to follow the delivery routes set by platforms. This is an example, uh, an exchange between uh, a conversation between riders, Chinese riders, in a uh, in a in a chat, and you can see uh, that. Um, they they share in this conversation. Uh, they share uh, tips about how uh, to deliver food. So, for example, rider A shares with rider B and C his tip about the quickest way to deliver food. He used to call the customer and ask him to be prepared for the delivery. So, in order that when when the rider comes, the the, the customer is is already in front of the door. Uh, so. You know, the rider doesn't uh, waste time uh, in uh, delivering the food. And these shorten the time of the delivery and uh, um, give the, the rider more time to, uh, to comply with the, uh, with the delivery. Because you, you, have to, you have to know that on Chinese food delivery platforms, every order comes with a, an expected time of delivery. If you do not deliver in time, you lose your ranking, you lose points. So you have a very, you are pushed not to, uh, and it's very difficult to comply with this expected time calculate, automatically calculated by algorithms. So many, many riders uh, that are experienced and, and, and uh, know, know the, the ground, they share also a lot of tips about how to uh, find a place, how to navigate the, in the, in the space, in the real space, in the physical world, without following the the path uh, suggested by the algorithm. So they do not respect Google Maps or suggestions of uh, because they know uh, better than the algorithm how to take shortcuts. No, um, so this reminds us the way the pedestrians described by Michel Deserteau didn't respect the path designed by urban planners. So the way people creatively and uh, uh, actively shape the, 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 um, uh, the way that the direction they take. And uh, um, in the, uh, at, the, at the end, so rider B agrees with rider A uh, and they, they share a, a lot of uh, tips about how to uh, improve uh, the um, the, uh, the their work and their and their delivery. A another this is a specifically this is a very specific of Chinese uh, riders. This is a, a tactic that we only found uh, uh, in uh, in China in this way. We found similar tactics also in India and in Italy too. But the Chinese uh, riders have a specific word. For, for this tactic, it is a, and this is a shuadan. What is shuadan? Um, when riders, at the end of the day, they, re, they understand that they still need more orders to gain the benefits to, um, or, or not losing positions in the ranking, they organize shuadan. What does it mean? It means that, and I can just, give a uh, jump to, the, to this uh, slide. So th this means that the rider uses two or more mobile phones to act contemporarily as, a, as, the customer, as the customer and the rider at the same time. So in the first step, the rider uses one phone and, and, uh, uh, and register himself as a, as a customer and makes an order as a customer while on the other smartphone, on the other mobile phone, he hopes to get the, the order from the algorithm. So he, so he cannot, of course, he cannot be sure 
that uh, the order that he makes as a customer will be received by him as a, as a rider. But they, they, they order, they make the order when they are in front of a restaurant. So they are quite sure that the algorithm will assign the order to them because they are, the, because the rider is the most, is the closest rider to that restaurant to which the, the customer uh, the, uh, make, made the order. No? So they, are, they have a high, and a high probability to receive the order that they, that they do, that they did uh, themselves. But they cannot do that if they do not um, agree with the restaurant. So the restaurant should be um, accomplice with these uh, with these with these tactics because the restaurant have to cook have to receive the order and pretend to cook the order and give the order to the rider without cooking. So it's a very complicated kind of uh, there is a lot of uh, organization uh, uh, um, and actions and efforts involved in these kind of tactics. And sometimes also restaurants used to do these kind of uh, uh, um, tactics. But so, and they used to um, share, so the, also to, to uh, for example, to uh, ask to other riders to uh, get involved in a shuadan in order to help another rider to, um, to increase some points. So uh, these are just some examples of the tactics we, we found on the ground or in the field work, but uh, just let um, uh, I will uh, just let you um, uh, I will just show some uh, um, examples of uh, what riders do with uh, within these uh, uh, private chat groups. We found six main ways in which riders usually employ, in the case of China, for example, WeChat groups to help each other. So these six different practices within WeChat groups also represent uh, six different manifestations of solidarity among Chinese riders. One, for example, is that riders provide news about the emergence or increase of temporary subsidies, or riders provide each other with uh, um, equipment assistance, uh, or riders provide emergency assistance. If uh, the motorbike of someone, uh, of, of a rider, uh, get broken in the middle of the road, uh, he asks for help to the community and a lot and the other riders come to save him, to take him uh, home. Or there are a, a lot of these kind of uh, um, cooperative behaviors that are in stark contrast with uh, the competitive logic embedded in, uh, in the platform, designed by the platforms. So they help newcomers get started quickly. They discuss a lot, they talk a lot about uh, the working of the of the algorithm how to understand the algorithm that is a black box no so they we call this collective unpacking of the platform's algorithm uh, and there are even fragile forms of solidarity but very important ones of uh, um, for example in this in these uh, screenshots one two and three uh, we can see examples from the italian case Riders share orders, even if um, it's, it's impossible to share orders on the platform. So when someone do not need uh, anymore a working shift, he shares the shift with anyone else in need of more shifts. But how can, uh, can uh, he do that if the app doesn't allow riders to, to exchange shifts? So <coughs> the, the platform apps, doesn't allow riders neither to communicate between each other, neither to exchange orders. So I receive an order, I book uh, a shift in order to, to work, but I, ca I cannot share this shift or I cannot share this order. So what they, what they, what they do? They found a way to synchronize through these private chats and exchange shifts anyway. So they, for example, rider A, uh, says, who wants a shift? Central Zone of Florence on Just Eat platform tonight from 8.30 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Uh, rider B uh, asks for another uh, shift. And so Rider C, I also look for evening shift in Novelli. So they coordinate each other. Then there is another rider who says, oh, I take the, 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 this shift. And then 
they they switch to uh, a, um, a private another private group between the two riders and they synchronize and they say oh wait i will uh, de deselect on the platform my the book of my the booking of my shift and as soon as i deselect the shift the shift will be available again and visible again on the on the platform and the other rider on the other part of the city is that it knows, knows that in that very moment the shift is open is available and and he can click on the on the newly available uh, shift so it's very um complicated but it works and in this way so they the um, they are able to uh, to exchange uh, uh, shifts that they don't need anymore. And these are just something that we discovered looking into the, the WhatsApp groups. So very to, to, uh, to summarize, and then I will uh, leave the floor to Emiliano for the uh, very conclusions. Our research, among many other findings, cast private WeChat groups and WhatsApp groups and uh, online private groups as uh, we uh, we think that we can understand these uh, these uh, the the function the the, the usefulness um, and the, um, of these uh, um, groups of these online environments as uh, learning environments as hidden transcripts of resistance and uh, as a solidarity building spaces. What does it mean to be that WeChat groups as learning environments? So in these online spaces, newcomers can learn from more experienced riders and all members can exchange tips and tricks. Everyone learns from the peers and together they build a collective algorithmic, algorithmic imaginary. So they built a, a, a way of uh, um, understanding uh, the, the algorithm. And uh, they are also hidden transcripts of resistance. This, this comes from uh, uh, James Scott again. So in uh, his analysis of everyday resistance practices, Scott traces a subtle difference between forms of resistance that openly manifest themselves in the face of power and forms that only manifest themselves far away from the power's gaze. We found traces of these hidden transcripts that Scott called, uh, as Scott called them, no? um, in the conversations happening among riders within which are private chat groups. For example, Chinese riders do not uh, talk each other in, within a corporate chat, but they used to uh, talk each other uh, in their private groups. So in the, when they are uh, in, um, in a, in inside chat groups that are supervised by a, a platform supervisor, they always do not literally write nothing while they comply and discuss and talk each other in private spaces where there are no supervisors. So uh, they never complain in corporate, in corporate chats, but they use private chats to openly express their dissent. So, and this online environment can be an incubator of future resilience and resistance practices. And third, uh, these groups as are solidarity building spaces what, I, what we mean, there are some research that is uh, talking about this, for example, Tassinari and Maccarone that called these online environments as day-to-day uh, -day mutual support spaces. And we showed how riders form smaller online groups from, from the participation in larger online groups. So they start knowing each other in larger online private groups, and then they form smaller uh, private online groups. And uh, so the latter allow, allows workers to meet and bond with their peers. Online food delivery platforms design their apps to govern each worker individually without allowing them to communicate with other peers. While private chat, on the other end, <coughs> provide a kind of a not technological affordance intentionally omitted by the platforms. 
they allow communication between peers, which in the long run creates an environment favorable to the construction of bonds of solidarity, exchanges of information, and increased awareness of one's condition of subalternity or, or exploitation. And I just leave, give the floor to Emiliano to uh, sum up and uh, give a, a, a grounded um, reflection on, um, on our findings. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Tiziano. Just to wrap up, basically. So thanks for like guiding you, uh, guiding us through these. You know, as you've seen, it's a, it's a kind of a journey. It takes a lot to to kind of disentangle this complexity because we got the complexity of the governing of the algorithms, and then we got the grassroots resistance to this. That as Tiziano, would, you know, was was highlighting, we are talking about something that is pervasive, that is every day resistance that is hidden sometimes and uh, and that's also uh, that we found in many different in these cross-cultural kind of multi-sided ethnography we were able to find it in different countries and we had hypothesized this so our hypothesis was like they're gonna have these but we we, we really couldn't see the magnitude uh, that the extent to which they will have like these all these kind of everyday resistances to true algorithm and also algorithmic solidarity so in the first meaning solidarity is solidarity mediated by algorithms so you got many food delivery riders finding opportunities to band together thanks to other types of algorithms and those that help them find like-minded people on doing or TikTok or YouTube where gig workers share experiences and advice. And it's also important, you know, all the point regarding uh, the pedagogical, uh, you know, value of this, which I think it's it's absolutely profoundly, uh, 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 it's uh, it's um, helpful. It's uh, it's key. And the second meaning solidarity around algorithms also you know develop you know around algorithm uh, in a way uh, that you can that i think you know at least for us it's something that was it was possible for us to recognize thanks to the fact that we did uh, basically carried out ethnography you know it's only you can only see that if you look around what's going on around algorithms and this is why i think it's pivotal it's absolutely fundamental to use ethnographic methods as, as well to look into algorithm. So the gaming tactics that we have for granted here are the evidence of these emerging forms of solidarity among writers. They reject, as, Boni as Tiziano has made clear through the presentation, these kind of ethos, these logics of competitiveness, the, which is encoded in the algorithms of the Chinese food delivery apps, but we could say, basically in all you know the delivery apps that we have uh, scrutinized and instead organized to support each other to survive in this really ruthless economy so despite the lack of opportunities for collective action and this really tightly controlled work environment these riders are able to uh, exercise their both individual and collective agency to maybe partially and temporarily improve their working condition. We're not, you know, we're not trying to romanticize this. <laughs> At the same time, we're really clear, both in the, in the paper, I think, and, and the book, even more that we're not, we're not here to provide a really kind of romantic or naive understanding of power in the, in the algorithmic age, but we cannot neglect this. This is happening, this is going on, it's important. So we want to demonstrate that despite this power imbalance and despite the injustices that uh, you know, we all know that define greatly the platform society, there are forms of resistance, uh, there are forms of solidarity that are still emerging and they're emerging every day in different realms and they are emerging across all the world as you know uh, not not only our work but you know our work with the multi-sided ethnography was able to illuminate so and before wrapping up i, I would just want to mention that the paper is co-authored with my former phd student now dr yu is a brilliant uh, young researcher that you know has collaborated with us in the algorithmic 
in the Algorist project and uh, in other uh, in other papers as well. And uh, and the is uh, is also you know it was also interviewed for this article that was just released on was just published on Wired and uh, is not with us today. But you know I want I, you know is 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 the leading author on the on the article. Uh, is whereas the book is uh, uh, is an idea and a project by me and Tiziano, but I think it's really important to mention this thing because uh, you know sometimes we you know we are we are you know higher in the in the academic hierarchy, but this thing is this you know as deserves to be recognized in this uh, as much and 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 is the one that allows us to actually gain the insights into the Chinese kind of anography. Without him, we, we wouldn't have been able to get this. And, and shout out also to the other great uh, research assistant that we had and with, the, with uh, which we are, with whom, sorry, we are writing, uh, you know, a kind of collective uh, uh, effort uh, paper that sums up all the different contribution. So uh, that hopefully it's gonna be out anytime soon. So, you know, I just want to close with that. And, you know, thank you very much. And we look forward to the debate to some kind of any kind of um, questions, concerns, I don't know, kind of uh, inspiration, provocation you might have. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. It was really, really interesting. Um, okay, well, thanks also for the other applause. Uh, from my students, and then, so let let's have a, a minute for a minute, some time for uh, a little bit of discussion. Okay, I want to lead the, the Q and A, so I'll start by asking: uh, there is someone who would like to maybe make a comment or uh, a question to our hosts? Something in find interesting. We have a question. Uh, uh, by Brunella, Alto Marini, who is a colleague here at GCU. Uh, Professor Alto Marini, she writes, can you find signs that this private solidarity is becoming the starting point of a real and concrete resistance? Uh, that is one that exerts pressure on the actual exploitation. So there is okay, something on the ground that can really boost and develop in your opinion. Well, maybe uh, I can uh, um, give some different examples. Uh, yes and no, the answer is. It, it means that um, from these everyday forms of resistance to more structured forms of resistance, uh, the, the transition is not uh, always easy, neither assured. No, it's not uh, frictionless. So we found, for example, in the case of China, of China um, these uh, uh, chat groups are also organized and uh, um, opened by kind of what we call these uh, informal trade unions. So emerging trade unions that are not registered also because in China, in China there is a, it's quite difficult to find a new trade union and there is a, a very uh, strict legislation on that so uh, for example the the league of uh, the league of, uh, of of kings so there are um, um, an association of writers that is trying to organize himself as a kind of a proto or primitive uh, trade union that of course coordinate his his efforts on uh, on uh, wechat in Indonesia, it's happening the same. So a kind of informal societies of, uh, of drivers and riders that uh, tax themselves, that um, have uh, a place to uh, to stand uh, and to to meet each other in the in the urban space, and that where they can uh, uh, fix the um, the motorbikes or whatever. And in Italy, in Naples, for example, we found the the, from some riders, this, uh, the foundation of a Casa del Rider, 
uh, a public space where they can have a shower or where they and this comes from uh, activists rather more politically conscious ones and other writers that became conscious on the ground you know so we see that this is something that is emerging and is structuring in different ways uh, in different countries but uh, is not going through the, the a process of being unionized from the from the from the top but is union kind of unionizing from the from below and uh, I think it's. I'm not uh, a specific scholar of uh, uh, social uh, on work and, and social movement studies, but this is something we could say that is similar to what happened in the in the early stage of uh, industrial uh, capitalism when working associations. For if you look at to the we we, we get inspired a lot from uh, um, um, AP, uh, Edward P. Thompson. Uh, history of the uh, British working class and how uh, this class became a class. Um, at the beginning, there were no uh, um, organized and structured the trade unions. And we are maybe the, facing another wave of uh, uh, with different characteristics of uh, resistance and unionizing. Okay, so uh, yeah, about the recording, yes, it would be uh, available uh, uh, soon. Uh, I see the um, again, Professor Altomani is kind of answering. Uh, um, so her question is about the uh, possibility when business these trade unions to be actual digital unions. I think it's an interesting question. Because, uh, interesting question because again, you are telling us that again, uh, this is something that. Uh, uh, comes from uh, a tradition of kind of workers uh, uh, organizing uh, and again finding solidarity from uh, by using new new tools and, and, and contemporary uh, digital media. But on the other hand, I mean, we know that many uh, observers and scholars again suggest maybe that the death of traditional unions uh, and of new ways of again of organizing this solidarity. Um, so again, do you think it might be again something new or? Again, as I think Borella maybe you would like to suggest this again, the surfacing of new new unions, new forms, uh, again of uh, uh, unionizing uh, and challenging the uh, those who are running the platforms. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's that's a great point, uh, but it's also context dependent. I want to say that you know, in some cases, you know, it depends on the, the legislation. We have this kind of paradox, but, but, but it's not a paradox, but it, it, at, the, at the heart of the platform economy, I mean, they're global, but at the same time, they're, they're local. So uh, we have seen, you know, actually to understand the, you know, the kind of local context and, and also the culture attached to it, it's in itself really difficult, you know, especially if you're not, um, if you have to do it from a distance. So in some cases, I believe that digital unions will work, but in others, um, they will not. So I don't know. It's, it's really, I think it's one of the tougher, the toughest kind of uh, uh, question that traditional, uh, you know, kind of labor organization are facing, but also labor studies are facing you know what to do with this you know some advo as uh, alberto was saying you know some are like uh, they say that you should be replaced altogether others are advancing a kind of hybrid forms like a, both digital and kind of more traditional and uh, in some cases it's really hard so i don't know i think there's not one fits all solution but uh, we find a lot of things and we were talking with Tiziano that, you know, there are also like some fringes of this that they're like really happy with not having any regulation at all, you know, in, in, in some in some cases, you know, so uh, it's just uh, it's really a multi faceted kind of scenario so it's uh, with different kind of solutions. Uh, and um, yeah, yeah, this is what I see so. Okay, thank you very much. Let's see, uh, let's read some more questions. Uh, 
Uh, have you found any relationships between the forms of governance uh, and the forms of datafication uh, in this type of activism? So the parallels between, again, the, um, the management of the platform uh, and, the, and the activism. Uh, again, I think that the gamification in some ways uh, uh, is a little bit there in the middle, but you, you can uh, argument a little bit on that, yeah. Uh, any forms of relationship between the forms of governance and the forms of notification? Um, well, I think that every every forms of governance of these platforms um, design a specific way of notification of a rider's performance. So, and um, every kind of we, we couldn't uh, say that. The datafication of uh, gig workers of all food uh, or online food delivery platforms is the same uh, for every platform. So there are different processes of datafication. Some platforms take into account uh, some kinds of data, and uh, other platforms take take into account and uh, other kinds of uh, of, uh, of data. And uh, so there is a and the, and the way they govern. Uh, the, the the workers online uh, uh, is different from platforms to to, to platform, and uh, at the same time, um, what uh, what riders do, what gig workers do, is to adapt to different forms of go governance and different forms of datification. So it kinds of uh, a continuous a, a, um, a continuous uh, symbiotic dynamic in which. Governance change, datafication change, and riders adapt. For example, at a certain point in, in Italy, Globo uh, introdu introduced the uh, a face recognition algorithm to uh, recognize the um, uh, the identity of the rider. In, and this was done in order to um, uh, to to avoid riders to exchange profiles. To work, uh, uh, to use the same profile uh, among different riders. So I cannot. No, I, I do. Uh, I, I'm always working 24 hours, but I share my my profile with my brother, my sister, and whatever. And this was happening massively in Naples. And uh, so they introduced face recognition algorithm, very invasive, uh, and very uh, a very a strong form of datification. Well. Three days, three days later, in the in the chat in a, in a chat that we were monitoring, uh, a rider came up with a, a tip, a specific uh, roadmap on how to game the uh, this uh, um, uh, algorithm. How to uh, so you have to put uh, uh, we we will not develop uh, uh, we will not reveal the techniques, but it was a very easy and analog techniques in, in a way. So, and they really uh, so were able to respond, actively respond to this process, to this new process of datification. And this happens with uh, every day. So we, in, a, in one year, we saw a lot of uh, differences in, uh, in, in changes uh, and edits of uh, uh, forms of governance in different platforms and continuously adaptation from, uh, from riders. I don't know if I really understood to the, to the question. Okay, I mean, the, the, uh, thank you very much, Tiziano. And the, ne the next question really uh, touches upon that uh, because the uh, next question by Dom is again, uh, uh, about the possibilities that uh, unearthing these kind of practices, uh, uh, this kind of ground up resistance can also be used to counter and nullify uh, the same practices. So if you also uh, find the risk of jeopardizing again, uh, uh, these kind of strategies uh, and, and tactics that are, um, again, if you can maybe uh, develop a little bit on, uh, on this point that you were already touching, so your own uh, kind of ethical, statements and also in, in relation to the, the, the publication of your work, uh, if you think it might have an impact uh, uh, in your publication, that's the question. 
uh, of course, um, I don't know if Emiliano wants to add something on that, but uh, of course we, we, we had a lot of discussion about that. And uh, uh, we didn't reveal in the book or in the presentations or in the papers, anything that was uh, not wanted by riders, because also we have uh, some conversations with uh, some of them became very relevant and continuous key informants for us. For example, some of them, the one, the one Italian writer also read the chapter that we wrote about the, this work and uh, was uh, in a way of can, kind of uh, checking what we can do, what we, can, we could uh, say and what we couldn't say and if we get it, pro, uh, if we get it right or not. And uh, in some cases, we didn't reveal some tactics, but in most of the cases, these tactics are known by platforms. They don't know, and they know that they that uh, online private groups exist and they coordinate their action, but they cannot do nothing, of course, on that. So we didn't we we we, we didn't um, uh, reveal what was really a secret from uh, or believed as a secret from writers but we really we revealed uh, uh, tactics and actions that are pretty well known by the platforms but on which is not so easy by the platforms to um, uh, to solve the problem from their point of view it's not it's not it's not completely and we also um, revealed just a, 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 we, we take a screenshot of a, a specific time, but if we did the, do the ethnography next year, of course, new tactics will come out uh, as a consequence of the adaptation of riders to the new changes operated by the platform on the um, on the affordances. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just just what Tiziano said. It's. Uh... There's a this is a really good question because it uh, and 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 I've seen that you know the 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 strategies that we had of of course you know not never you know put something uh, out that wasn't discussed with riders before and also we have a lot of data that you know we 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 cannot use you know as as Lenny and 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 I've seen what has been published on this and I think that we follow basically the same strategies. Of other scholars, because if you look around what has been published on this, we there are tactics that we cannot share and things that you know are you know beyond a certain threshold that we were uh, um, that we cannot transpass that we cannot overcome and other things that um, as Tiziano was saying that are well known but at the same time they cannot be acted upon because it's part of this and it's also always a trade-off so like with the you know with the publication of these and um, other kind of uh, you know things on on also mainstream press like wired uh, are you are you actually you know <laughs> uh, publicizing these and getting more attract uh, you know attention to something that would be more controlled maybe you could argue that at the same time you can argue that this is becoming you know something that is more in the public eye and uh, uh, under more scrutiny, so that that that's always a bit of this. But in terms of ethical clearance and in terms of uh, what we have done, yeah, we have followed really tight protocols. And 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 beside, I mean, this is the, the you know this is something that we always done with the uh, these kind of interviews, of course, which are really a bit more uh, um, you know problematic in many ways. But you know, I've I've dealt with activists for for a long time. Uh, for more than 15 years and uh, there are cases where you know there are things that you don't publish at all because you cannot cross the threshold but this is a really you know good question from the from an ethical standpoint okay thank you very much okay we have uh, maybe a final uh, question just right from natalia uh, is thanking you uh, so with the growing dependency on algorithm-based technology in each aspect of life, it seems inevitable to either have uh, to resist through tricking the system or to follow its black box logic. Is this inevitable or are there ways of limiting uh, 
the pervasiveness of uh, algorithmic uh, and data-driven infrastructures? Uh, I mean, this is a, a huge question uh, in the future. So Natalia has this kind of huge question. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I, I can, I can uh, be more specific with a, a question from, from myself. Uh, um, because again, um, amongst the many uh, tactics you were describing, uh, so maybe you can uh, point towards something more specific. Uh, uh, I mean, the kind of pattern of solidarity was really emerging, uh, but I was really surprised by the, um, the Shuadan tactic, uh, because to my opinion, that works differently, works, like, works more like on the obfuscation side, my kind of forging like uh, false data, kind of, um, again, obfuscating and tricking uh, more than, again, uh, using uh, uh, solidarity, solidarity amongst the again, the riders. So if you want to start from that, maybe consideration about that kind of the difference of that strategy or the tactic compared to the other, and maybe if you want to make some a final comment again uh, on the, this kind of huge uh, uh, question on the inevitability uh, and pervasiveness of uh, uh, the data logic. Uh, Tiziano, you, you want to start on that, and then I will finish with the apocalyptic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, apocalyptic. You know, just you know, absolutely broad. You know, broad but necessary question. Uh, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. it's also a good question to end, I suppose. Yeah, it's a good uh, question to uh, to close the cycle. Uh, well, you you're right that in the case of Shwadan uh, um, and in other cases also as well. Um, they could be conceived or understood as scams or as a, uh, not so, but uh, not so cooperative practices. But most of the times, or many times, these uh, these practices uh, were shared inside uh, WhatsApp groups, so WeChat groups. So I, I share with you, I let you know how to scam or how to uh, get these orders. So this is a way. This is a proof that. I do not want to, to uh, keep for, uh, for me this, this secret, but I want to share it with you, with other riders, because you know I know that it's very difficult at the end of the day to, to match with, uh, to comply with uh, the, um, the, the orders and the, the points and the ranking. So um, it's a way of sharing tricks, even if it's a scam. And I think that, or well, I think, well, talking with, uh, with them, uh, with these uh, riders, most of them, many of them, I, I would say every one of them says that they do not want to scam or to, to game uh, uh, the platforms because they hate them. They just do that when they have uh, no other means to comply with uh, the, uh, the, the wish, when they have no other choices, no other or one when they perceive that they do not have any other available choices, legal choices. So, and they, so at a certain point they say, "Oh, I do not care about you, about the morality or not of these." Uh, in my, in my, uh, from my point of view, this is moral. This is okay, even if it's not allowed, because this makes me. Uh, make ends meet, uh, or makes me survive. So it's, a, it's another point of view. We don't want to in introduce this uh, uh, issue now, but we have uh, a long uh, discussion in the book about the different moral economies of platforms and riders. We claim that riders act according to a different moral economy in the in the way in the way conceived by Edward P. Thompson, um, ra, uh, different from the platform moral economy, and uh, just to uh, try to uh, first answer to the, to the to this last question, well, from the, from below, so riders are uh, very uh, uh, the their their work and their everyday life is highly structured by computational power. And they just can uh, find small, fragile, uh, temporary, uh, ephemeral ways of uh, resisting uh, based on algorithms. So algorithm, algorithm uh, repertoire no? um, to cope with them. So for them is uh, inevitable. So they feel it is inevitable 
to to cope with algorithms in their everyday life because they cannot do other kind of works or in that very moment they they just have that and they have to cope with that and they have to take the best from uh, uh, from that condition no? but so they don't really reflect on they have the time and the efforts and the strength to reflect on a uh, on the pervasiveness of algorithmic and data-driven infrastructures in the everyday life. This is, I think, the effort that uh, politics, society, civil society should uh, uh, should take. So this is, is a different level of discussion. So from from below, from from the top uh, and from outside, uh, that we we should act to change these. Uh, inevitability of the of this per pervasivity Emiliano what? yeah uh, no no you said it all I mean I just want to say maybe coming back to the initial distinction to close it all we we said it's repertoire and stakes right and we see this as a you know I will say as a as a dialectical relationship so you know it, it's not uh, it's not that we, we are changing things as we do both with these kind of more let's call them micro everyday pervasive forms of resistance and at the same time sometimes they escalate to a certain level so uh, you know and but i'm you know i'm a i'm a sociologist of practice mainly so i believe that you know sometimes there's no micro or, ma or macro but it's all part of these you know flux of ever changing things that where we when we look at the everyday and we look at these things that we document we're not just looking at some kind of uh, small attempts to change that then they are frustrated we're looking at ways in which more kind of in which stronger and uh, you know unions may take form or other people will then become actors leading actors in the government or whatever and so we're looking at change uh, as well uh, happening in real time you know across all the world so i think that these these points to you know this gives us some hope at least you know for some kind of structural change but we are not naive in any way we're not romanticizing these as in oh, well, this is happening there's an imbalance in this and uh, when we look at algorithms as stakes, we need to recognize that sometimes instead, as you say in your really good question, why, uh, can we not change it? Are we just victims? Are, are we just allowed to change what's been already happened? Where we, we maybe we can have a voice in the real implementation of the system in the first place if we fight back here. So I believe we can be more we can even stronger about this and these coexist as Tiziana was saying with this kind of uh, uh, ever present uh, uh, daily resistance so they uh, so maybe in the future we have a say uh, uh, and as workers as uh, i don't know as uh, academics as whatever in the implementation of this data fight system in the first place the fight is on so we're living it. We are experiencing it. And thanks a lot for the great question. I mean, I wish I had, had you know, definitely, and I cannot say that, but better question that I had today in class, I gotta say. So, you know, bring it on. <laughs> okay. Thank you very, very much for your uh, uh, contribution and for being with us. Uh, I would like to thank also all the audience uh, and again, the Department of, of Communication that led us uh, uh, organizing this event. Um, so thanks to all our attendees and uh, stay stay tuned for the next uh, season of the ne next semester in, uh, in the fall uh, for our discussions on digital cultures. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you all. Really. See you soon. Thanks.